Dr. Goff, welcome back to Contagion. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So could you give us your background and then we'll get into this recent paper on antibiotic resistance? Sure. I'm a professor of pharmacy practice at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and do global antibiotic stewardship. So I work with the World Health Organization in helping to implement stewardship in low middle income countries. And I've really traveled the world helping hospitals implement stewardship. And we recently have a paper, several papers, but the, the headline paper involves 38 Michigan hospitals taking a look at their antibiotic prescribing patterns during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a bit more insight onto what happened? Sure. It's a great study. I mean, COVID has taught us so much. We're literally learning something new every day, which is pretty exciting in the field of infectious diseases. So what I liked about this is it's multi-center and Michigan was really one of the hotbeds of COVID. And they looked at concurrent antibiotic prescribing, excluding azithromycin that was being used with hydroxychloroquine. Mm -hmm. So antibiotics being prescribed for concurrent, supposedly bacterial pneumonia. And what they found is it was all over the place. About half of the patients were getting antibiotics, but the range was from 27 to 84% of patients were getting concurrent antibacterials for what they thought was pneumonia. But the reality was only three and a half percent of patients actually had a concurrent bacterial infection. So if you think of that, all of those patients got exposed to an unnecessary antibiotic. Why did it happen? And it's sort of the just in case prescribing of antibiotics, which is what I did a whole entire TED talk on because I see it over and over again. But in the management of COVID, Early on, I give everyone a free pass because we were in such turmoil trying to manage a COVID patient. We didn't know what this was. These patients went from you know, um, room air to intubation in 12 hours. And when you watch young people just go from walking into the hospital to intubated on death's door, you literally throw the kitchen sink at them in desperation of trying to save their life. And that literally was the beginning of COVID. You know, these patients came in, yes, we knew COVID was a viral infection, but their chest X-rays had bilateral whiteout. Uh, you could not get a rapid test back anytime rapidly for COVID or to document a viral or bacterial respiratory tract infection. A, most hospitals don't even have the viral panels in their hospital, but of the few that did, you know, getting a sample from a COVID patient was a challenge. There were so many complexities in, and barriers in the beginning that giving them antibacterial therapy, I support. But now as it's unfolded and we've learned more and we now know that that isn't the norm that they're infected with a co-infection with a bacterial isolate, uh, we can do better. So I think this study really provides the data. You know, the data doesn't lie. Um, you have a lot of preconceived ideas that based on the chest X-ray and their decompensation that of course there must be something more than just COVID and you give them antibiotics. But now we've learned very few are actually co-infected and we're starting to develop a risk profile of the patient that is more likely to be co-infected with a bacterial infection, such as a nursing home patient, um, a COPD patient, someone with a lot of antibiotic exposure. Um, or they get intubated and they are COVID positive and then they develop a co-infection while they're intubated in our hospital, which is now a healthcare associated infection. So we've learned so much more. And I think the Michigan study was very valuable because it really showed that early data of how often antibiotics were being given, uh, but the patients were 3% that actually had co-infection, it's very low. I know that this is probably a broad question that you get a lot, but I don't think one can say it enough times, really. Mm -hmm. What happens when we overuse antibiotics? Sure. Well, 
we know the answer to that now because we're living in an era of untreatable bacterial infections. And that's sort of how I use COVID to our advantage to message antibiotic resistance challenges around the world in addition to COVID when people realize there's really no treatment for COVID. It's supportive care and we're trying to discover the treatment, but in the first month or two when we were treating it, there really was no treatment and people were shocked because young, healthy people were dying of an untreatable infectious disease as if they've never heard of it. But anybody that does antibiotic stewardship, we live it every day. We have untreatable urinary tract infections. We have untreatable pneumonia. We have organisms that we have no antibiotic therapy for. So we are living in an era of untreatable infections. And guess what happens? When you get one of them, many people die. And that is our message. So how is COVID, what, what's going to happen now that we've exposed a lot of patients to unnecessary antibiotics? It's sort of twofold. The other part of a study um, done in Pittsburgh, looking at their antibiotic use during COVID, actually in the hospital as a whole, their antibiotic use is down. And that makes sense because we literally shut down all surgical procedures during COVID. And guess who gets the lion's share of antibiotics in most hospitals? Surgical patients, rightfully so. They need them for surgical prophylaxis. And then many times they continue them just in case afterwards, which needs work. But surgical patients do get a lot of antibiotics. And so when we stopped all elective surgical procedures, the overall tonnage of antibiotic use actually went down. And that's what the Pittsburgh study showed. Their antibiotic use overall from the previous year, if you compared the first three months of COVID to last three, last year, same time frame, the antibiotic use in the hospital setting was less. But it's not less if you compare the patients that were admitted to the hospital during COVID and looked at the number of patients and the percent that got antibiotics, then it turned out to be quite high because most of those patients were COVID patients and they all got antibiotics. So I think we're going to see a downstream effect that will not be positive. I think it will increase overall antibiotic resistance globally because the antibiotic use in the outpatient setting we don't really know what took place there. We know a lot of patients avoided coming to hospitals. So where did they go? You know, people still get urinary tract infections. They still get sinusitis. Um, those things don't stop because of COVID. So what was the antibiotic prescribing like in the outpatient setting during COVID? Um, that hasn't been evaluated yet, or maybe it's going on. Uh, but we don't know the answer to that. My suspicion would be it's probably increased in the outpatient setting. So a lot of antibiotic use leads to antibiotic resistance. And that's what we clearly have right now. And it's global. You mentioned too that there's a sort of parallel between when a novel viral strain arrives and the conditions of a anti of, of a world with substantially weakened or less effective antibiotics, um, can you elaborate on that a little bit in terms of the the global health threat? Because I think one thing that COVID nineteen has made me realize is that there are a lot of big numbers in comparisons when it comes to mortality from infectious diseases and uh, bacterial infections and things like that. Um, to the point that it almost becomes noise, you know, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people dying of tuberculosis each year, that, that can be dehumanized in a sense. So I just, I guess I just, one thing somebody told me, told me was that it, it, it's almost like going back to a time when, um, like a razor cut could really hurt you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you look at the impact of antibiotic resistance um, because of COVID, and you look at low middle income countries and the impact there. So to kind of go further on your point, in South Africa, where I work a lot, and so 
they have a high rate of tuberculosis and a high rate of HIV. So those things don't stop just because of COVID, they continue. And there's a lot of concern because patients could not access healthcare when we did shelter at home and all the medical professionals' care, uh, time and effort were diverted to taking care of COVID patients. But the management of TB and HIV, which are chronic diseases with high mortality, continued, but there was no one to care for them. And people stopped coming to get prescriptions and you interrupt your long-term HIV care or your TB care, guess what happens? Bad outcomes. You develop resistance to the HIV therapy that was controlling your HIV or your TB comes back with a vengeance. And now you have multi-drug resistant TB or XDR TB because you interrupted your therapy. Those stories are unfolding right now. And I don't think those stories are gonna be good stories. I think we're gonna see really negative impact from COVID's disruption of our healthcare around the world. And that includes the United States. So that's kind of the negative part of what I see COVID impacting other infectious diseases that are chronic that we quote, had under good control. The other one is vaccination rates. You know, pediatric vaccination rates have plummeted throughout COVID. And that's in the US and I can't imagine what it is in the low middle income countries. So there's gonna be a consequence for that. I mean, we've already seen in the United States when the anti-vaxxers were talking of, you know, convincing people not to vaccinate, we had measles and mumps outbreaks. Well, now we just have basic pediatric vaccinations of childhood rates that have really dropped because of COVID. So there's a lot of consequences that are gonna occur uh, because of the impact of COVID globally.